Hello and welcome to the EcoCast events produced by Actual Tech Media. Today's topic being building a next generation IT environment. My name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'm excited to be your moderator for today's EcoCast. On this EcoCast, you'll hear from experts at Rubrik and Faction, two of the most innovative companies out there in the industry today. Uh, we've got some really cool presentations lined up for them, uh, from them today. So thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us on the EcoCast. Before we jump into it, just a little bit about the event that you should know. Uh, we want this to be educational. We've got the questions box there in the left-hand side of your audience console, and we welcome your questions. We'll be doing Q&A sessions with each of today's presenters, so keep those questions coming. Uh, of course, we welcome all the hello and good morning, uh, good afternoon messages from across the United States and around the world. So thank you so much for those. Uh, we love the Actual Tech Media audience, and we appreciate your support. We also want this to be a social event. We'll be uh, tweeting about the event uh, during uh, this EcoCast, and you can do the same using the Twitter icon on the bottom of your screen. The hashtag for today's event will be automatically appended. It is ATM EcoCast, and feel free to follow me as well and also Actual Tech Media over on Twitter. You can find the social icons for Actual Tech Media on the top right-hand side of your audience console. Uh, it's there that you'll see icons for YouTube, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Uh, speaking of LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn is where we post all of our latest and greatest content. So uh, if you're going to pick one, just uh, pick LinkedIn. I would, I would recommend that. Um, but of course, uh, YouTube uh, is very popular for us as well. We post all of our events on the YouTube, uh, our YouTube homepage. So uh, follow us there to get uh, uh, alerts for all the latest Actual Tech Media events after they've happened, of course. Uh, but you'll be redirected after this event to the Actual Tech Media events homepage where you can learn about upcoming events before they happen so that you can register live for an event just like this. You can also subscribe to the 10 on Tech podcast over in the iTunes store produced by Actual Tech Media. We also have a number of handouts there in the handouts tab. Uh, I can call your attention to it. Uh, it's on the left-hand side of your screen there, and it's there that you'll find a link to the Rubrik homepage for more information, as well as a resource there from Faction. Uh, specifically, it's the full slide deck uh, that you'll see presented on today's event. If you'd like to download that in PDF, feel free to do that. And then on the EcoCast today, we'll be awarding three Amazon $500 gift cards to three lucky attendees on the live event. If you're watching this on demand, I'm sorry, of course, the drawing has already occurred. The prize terms and conditions can be found in the handouts tab. Uh, you can also find the event agenda down there in the bottom of your screen where it says event schedule to see the rough schedule of today's event. The prize uh, terms can be found, like I said, in the handouts tab. All prize winners must submit an IRS Form W-9 to Actual Tech Media. And with that, I'm excited to kick off today's presentation with an expert interview uh, from none other than Mr. Bill Clayman, uh, author, blogger, speaker, and executive vice president uh, for all things digital at Switch. Uh, uh, Bill is a uh, keynote speaker at numerous events around uh, the United States and across the world, and you can follow Bill over on Twitter where he is Quadstack, uh, so make sure you check out uh, Bill's Twitter link there. And with that, uh, let's kick it off. Here we go with Bill Clayman. I'm excited to be joined by Mr. Bill Clayman. Bill, for those who don't know you, tell us who you are and what you do. Hey everybody, I'm Bill Clayman, EVP of Digital Solutions over at Switch, and also I'm a blogger, writer, industry analyst, and somebody who is just an all-around techie. And you have to be the most energetic guy in the industry, Bill. Uh, it's always good to have you on. It always boosts me up. I know it boosts up, you know, the energy level here of our events. So thank you for joining us. Um, you know, I know we chatted back earlier, much earlier this year, before maybe all this craziness happened about the state of the data center in 2020 report uh, that you published or, or helped to create. And, you know, back then things were different and, and something has changed. There's new updates. You've been doing some more research on this. Tell us what's going on. 
Well, this is the exciting part. I can't, I can't believe we're talking. It feels like February and March was like a decade ago. Did you know that Windows 7 went end of life in January? Somebody <laughs> pulled that stat up. I'm like, no way. It was 10 years ago. They're like, no, no Bill. It was, it was I guess a January. better upgrade, huh? It's time to upgrade. I hope everybody does. And if, listen, the, the side note, I know we have a limited time to talk here, but like, if you need, haven't upgraded yet, let, let's talk. Um, so yes, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I'm, I feel so bad that I can't see people right now. I, I can't high five or give you guys a hug. Um, it's definitely different, but we're, we're coping. So I'm sending my energy your way. We did the AFCOM State of the Data Center report and we published the findings uh, back in, in, in February and March. And obviously we got a lot of people asking us, Bill, these are really good trends and questions around data center growth, network optimization and usage, automation, people, hiring, can you do an update that's let's say post COVID. And so we did, and we published the results uh, and we talked about them uh, in the beginning of, uh, of September. And we found out some really interesting things, M maybe not entirely surprising, but certainly very interesting. So first of all, it's really good to be in the data center and technology industry. It really is. Um, from the previous report of this one, we saw that the total number of data centers being built actually jumped about five percentage points. Uh, the total number of data center being renovated or redone also jumped. Um, the biggest number, interestingly enough, of data centers being constructed, this is at the edge, at the core and distributed, was five to nine new locations. That was the biggest percentage of that we saw over the previous year. Um, and that was fascinating. And obviously you're not surprised every single, almost every single uh, uh, respondent said that there was increases in traffic, for example. Um, I think it was more than 70% noticed a traffic increase in their, in their infrastructure. One of our customers specifically said, Bill, Bill, we went from maybe five to 10 connections remotely a day, thousands, thousands per day. And I mean, they were able to handle it. So definitely good to be in the data industry but we're seeing some, some, some network increases out there in usage of our critical infrastructures as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, we'll talk about remote work here in just a little bit, but I have heard stories of companies that went from, you know, of course, a handful of employees working remotely uh, to, you know, thousands of employees working remotely overnight and they had to deal with that. And so the data center has got to be more critical than ever. Um, what about hiring? What did, what did you see in the report around hiring? So let's talk about people. And then this was really interesting part. Um, over a third, almost 40% of the respondents, and we're, again, we're talking like the hyperscalers of the world, the smaller data centers, the, uh, the big cloud shops, plan to increase investment in hiring of data center and technology personnel within the next three years. And almost 45% plan to increase investments into those people, so like training, uh, healthcare, uh, secondary benefits. A lot of people are, are looking for help, uh, and it's definitely good to be in tech. Only 85% uh, I'm sorry, about 85% of respondents experienced some kind of um, uh, experience either only a furlough or, or saw no changes at all. So let me, let me say that again, 85% either furloughs for a short amount of time or, or basically nothing happened. I mean, there's a lot of stability in our industry. Yeah. Um, it's just something you gotta, gotta keep, an eye, keep an eye on. Now, obviously changes in rules and protocols, we saw that go up as well. I think something like 85 to 90% of the companies created new rules and protocols to keep people safe. Um, now, working remotely, as I'm sure that we all are right now, that's actually kind of different and very interesting as well. Um, I'm going to touch on that. I'm going to touch on that, David, because I, I thought it was interesting. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we're all dealing with, you know, work from home. Uh, a lot of us have got, you know, kids homeschooling at the, at the same time, the dogs barking. Uh, we're trying to deal with this new work environment and, and we're making the best of it, uh, thankfully. Um, so we, we get to work from home in our, you know, pajamas or at least pajama <laughs> bottoms if we're on pajama video. Right. Um, so, I mean, what did the reports say around remote work? Half of those, um, that are actually with all the people that are working remotely right now, about half, more than 54%, about 55% believe that the current makeup of the workforce is going to become permanent. Okay. That was a little bit higher maybe than I thought. But I think that's great, right? We're seeing people like REI and Twitter and Reddit saying, you know, time out. I, I feel like my people can be productive. I feel like I've given them the tools to be productive and be efficient. Why not continue to work from home? And again, I'm, I'm not really surprised around this. Keep people safer, keep people productive off the road, certainly. Um, and I think that a lot of what we're going to be seeing right now is far as people working remotely and being productive is, is going to become a new normal. Now, I love seeing the kids and I love seeing the puppies pop in the video, I, videos. I feel like it's a great interpersonal time that we connect with folks a little bit differently, but you might start seeing people work from home a little bit more. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, personally, I've been working f from home since 2008. Um, so it, I've just kind of gotten used to it, but uh, it's, it's a different dynamic. I know for a lot of people, but once, I mean, for me personally, once I started working from home, I really don't have an interest in putting on, you know, a, a dress up shirt and, and slacks and going to the office for eight hours a day, uh, and honestly, anymore. And so I'm sure a lot of people, once they fall into this groove, they get productive. Um, they're not going to want to go back. I agree. Absolutely. I think we're going to see a bit of a shift in terms of how people are productive and the tools that they use uh, to be productive as well. And that's kind of an important point as far as this whole concept of, you know, innovation. Absolutely. So um, any final thoughts on the report? I know we're running out of time. All right. I'm going to give you guys, everybody listening to this, uh, one final few pieces of advice. Because of this report and some of the things that we're seeing in the industry, I, I really want people to understand what organizations and leaders are investing in. Um, hyper automation, more than 70% of people in that report, the respondents are now saying they're seeing an increased use of automation and data control within the data center, especially for smaller tasks. This includes working with multi-experience, the democratization of technology. Here is the big one. No more of this, this crazy nomenclature around AI and uh, NLP. Those are still really awesome, but what we're actually starting to create are human centric technologies, human augmentation, not replacing people, but augmenting their skills and the value that they bring. This is the really important part to understand here. We're actually trying to create an architecture where people are empowered to use these systems. You know that word future-proof? Pause on that for now, because you could have the most amazing future-proof technology out there, but your people are still confused and it's complicated to use. What we're creating are burnout-proof technologies, advanced systems that enable people to be more productive, healthier in some instances, and use technology to optimize everything they do. Let me make this next part clear. This whole challenging scenario that we've got right now, those organizations that were at least somewhat prepared, they fared better. If you're a small business, that's the case, medium or large enterprise. That is always going to be the case. When you invest in technology and people, you don't know what's going to happen next. You don't know what the next big one might be. But as long as you're somewhat prepared to support people working remotely, you're going to fare better. Final thought, this word innovation is no longer this cool, funky marketing word that we're going to be seeing out there. It truly is about survival. I can't stress that enough. So know what it takes for you to be innovative because that's truly contextual, forget the marketing word, and understand what you can do to survive, hopefully never again, but if something like this happens. Absolutely, yeah, I mean, you see on the news all the time, the businesses, businesses that are innovating are surviving and even thriving, maybe doing better than ever, having record sales. The businesses that aren't are, are unfortunately dying and failing. So innovation is, is the key word. If you take away one thing from this interview with Mr. Bill Clayman, uh, Bill, if people are looking for uh, this report, or they want to find out more information on you or, or switch, what should they do? Absolutely. Uh, check out the AFCOM webpage. You can just Google AFCOM State of the Data Center Report 2020. You will find the original as well as the update. You can find me on Twitter, Quad Stack, Q U A D Stack, um, where I live tweet a lot of the fun events like VMworld right now that I can't be in. I'm really sad. Uh, and a whole lot of other things. You can obviously find me on LinkedIn as well. I'd love making new friends. But beyond anything else, stay safe, be kind, and support one another. Awesome. Thanks so much, Bill. Thanks, guys. Excellent. Really cool interview there with Mr. Bill Kleiman. Um, I've just brought up our first poll question. Uh, the question on the screen here, sometimes we do kind of fun questions like this to give us some insight uh, on the future, and I will share the results of this poll with you. Uh, the question is, with the rise of virtual events, many vendors have added major entertainment segments to their event, you know, you know, rock performers, um, headline, you know, movie stars that come on and speak. Uh, so, you know, bands, comedians, what are your thoughts on these segments? We're curious, and I will share the results of this with you. You can, you know, kind of see how you, uh, your vote tallies up with all the others on the event today. Uh, if you haven't answered one of these polls before, you do it right there in the slides window. Uh, if you don't see the poll, push refresh on your web browser. Uh, I recommend using Chrome or Firefox, uh, and 99% of the time a refresh will uh, trigger that poll up on the screen there. So. Uh, go ahead and answer that poll, and I'll share the results coming up uh, right now. Missed the poll results on that one. 
Uh, actually, the results were, I don't have the poll handy, results handy, uh, but the results here, I'll just tell you, uh, it was actually a tie uh, between 40% said they're awesome and another 40% said I can take it or leave it. So, you know, kind of split decision there. 19% um, said I really don't like it, don't need it. If I want entertainment, I have YouTube, I have Netflix. I just want the you know technical educational content. So thank you for all the uh, votes on that poll. Let me bring up our second poll now, and that is what's your time frame for adding new or updating existing IT solutions at your company? Specifically, here we're talking about you know building your next gen IT environment. It's likely that you're on this event to learn about kind of next generation technologies and solutions. And so, you know, what's your time frame to implement some of those at your uh, IT organization or in your data center? I'll give you another moment to answer that question, and then I'll be introducing you to our first presenters on today's Ecocast. All right, thank you everyone who responded to that poll. We'll have a couple more, couple more polls throughout the event. So of course we appreciate your participation in those but it's time to kick off the EcoCast. I'm excited to introduce our first set of presenters here, or welcoming Mr. Matt Elliott, Developer Advocate at Rubrik, and Mr. Tony Carrero, Enterprise Systems Manager at the University of the Pacific. Tony is a customer of Rubrik uh, and here to share his story. So uh, Matt, Tony, take it away. Uh, as introduced, my name is uh, Matt Elliott. I'm a developer advocate at Rubrik, and I thank you all for joining us today. Uh, with us today is one of our customers, Tony Carrero, with the University of the, of the Pacific. In this session, I'll give a brief overview of the products Rubrik offers, and then I'll turn it over to Tony, and he's going to talk about what he's doing at the University of the Pacific and their journey to the cloud. In a nutshell, Rubrik is cloud data management. But what does that mean? Whether you need to protect resources in your on-premises data center or instances running in the cloud, Rubrik has the capability to ensure that your important data is protected. Even if you haven't started your cloud journey, Rubrik has cloud archiving capabilities built in, allowing you to leverage inexpensive cloud storage and ditch depending on tapes. This is what our on-premises protection basically looks, at, looks like from a high level, and we call this Rubrik CDM. At the center of our product is the SLA policy engine, which simplifies the job of defining recovery point objectives for your resources. The same policy defines retention, archiving, and replication settings all in the same place. You can use our pre-canned SLAs or create new policies to match your business needs. Then it's just as simple as pointing rubric towards a virtual environment and assigning an SLA to your resources. Rubric takes over from there, backing up data and archiving it to the cloud. Simplicity is truly at the core of our product, but behind that simplicity is a load of impressive tech. After you've archived your VMs to the cloud, Rubrik can convert them from their original VM format to a cloud-native image. As you'll hear from Tony in a moment, this is a convenient way to migrate workloads to the cloud and can also be used for a disaster recovery. If you've spent much time working in the major clouds, you know that their APIs are at the very core of their platform. Well, Rubrik is the same. Our platform was designed to be API first. Every single action performed through the UI is making an API call to the Rubrik cluster. This means that you can easily automate tasks in Rubrik using tools like Python, PowerShell, Ansible, and Terraform. With these tools, you can integrate Rubrik into existing management tooling and build new integrations and offerings. Personally, I'm constantly surprised by our customers and the interesting ways they use our API. So with a little imagination, there's almost no limit to what can be accomplished. The last CDM uh, feature I wanted to touch on briefly is our native immutability. Th those are big words, but basically what this means is that after your, back your backup data is written to a rubric cluster, it cannot be changed. This immutability is at the core of our custom file system, which powers rubric CDM. This means that rubric is untouchable by malware and ransomware, and systems protected by rubric are easily recoverable should a disaster strike. When combined with the de defense in depth approach to security, Rubrik provides the last line of defense in your ransomware defense strategy. Attacks are on the rise right now, so if you haven't thought through your recovery strategy, consider being put in the position of having to pay a ransom to unlock your critical data. 
We have customers who've been in the same spot, and fortunately, they've never had to entertain paying off credit. The current pandemic has only accelerated cloud adoption, and for these resources, our Polaris SaaS platform has got you covered. Polaris provides predictions for assets deployed in the public cloud, as well as Office 365. It also acts as a control plane for rubric clusters deployed in your data center, allowing you to manage data protection across your enterprise through a single UI. We're continuing to add new capabilities to Polaris, such as ransomware detection and recovery and data governance, our radar app, um, which is one of the apps that runs on top of Polaris, analyzes your backups to look for signs of ransomware infection. If an attack is detected, compromised files can be restored in a few clicks. Sonar, our new data governance tool, helps you understand where sensitive data is stored, including locations you may not have been aware of. If you're subject to HIPAA, PCI, or GDPR compliance, this is an essential tool. That's enough for me. I'll stick around to the end of the session, and I'm happy, happy to uh, answer any questions you have. But now I'd like to turn it over to Tony. Thanks, Matt. Hello, everyone. I'm Tony Carrero, and I'm the Enterprise Systems Manager at the university. I manage a team of systems and application engineer for the university, responsible for everything from servers, storage, uh, to our ho hosted cloud services and applications. Uh, just a little bit about the university. We're a private university based in Northern California. We have campuses in Sacramento, San Francisco, and our primary location in Stockton. We offer over 80 undergraduate programs and 30 graduate programs, serving over 6,000 st students across the university. We have three data centers across the three campuses, uh, approximately 600 servers, over 90% vir virtualized with VMware and Amazon EC2, and our ERP system is also in AWS. Um, we also host several SaaS applications, including um, Canvas, uh, our learning management system. And we have a complete implementation of the Office 365 suite, which is available to all students, faculty, and staff. Uh, we also pride ourselves of being a cloud-first institution. Just a little description on that. Um, what we mean by cloud-first is when selecting technologies for university needs and processes, we look to hosted providers and cloud options first and typically try to go with what makes sense for the given use case. This factors in functionality, usability, cost ROI, uh, the overall goal, with the overall goal of reducing the footprint and reliance on our on-premise data centers. This helps reduce the overall risk of disrupt disruption to university technology services, and is especially important uh, in this day and age with the transition of the vast majority of our academic services to remote learning. This also supports the goal of providing digital equity for our student communities by providing students access to software needed to support their educational goals from any location with the internet. We believe Rubrik has played a critical role in our cloud first journey and positioned us ahead of the curve, particularly in data protection and management, and especially given the cir uh, current circumstances in California and beyond. So even though we're cloud first, uh, we were faced with two major sets of challenges a couple of years ago with our legacy environment that were directly impacting university business and limiting our initiatives, particularly around technology. These centered around um, two major factors, so requiring backup modernization and the fact that we were lacking significant capabilities in the cloud, particularly as it relates to uh, data management and protection. Um, these things include, included an expensive and dated legacy solution, um, increasing licensing costs, um, inability to scale with the hardware, uh, lengthy RTO, um, excessive manual management, um, uh, and then more importantly, the inability to archive to the cloud, which was a big deal to us. Um, we were previously relying on site-to-site -site replication and we had a, a desire to essentially move our offline backups and archival completely to the cloud so that way we do a site to cloud um, topology instead of site to site. Uh, lack of DR readiness, um, uh, no AWS native protection. Like so many other institutions, we were growing in AWS uh, more and more instances and we didn't really have a viable way to be to consistently back those up. Although I know AWS does provide some tools on that in that regard. Uh, we really were looking for more of that single pane of glass uh, and the backups to match what we were doing on-premise. 
And then, of course, uh, no backups for Office 365. Um, at, at the time, we were currently undergoing a migration uh, from our on-premise email to Office 365 Exchange Online and quickly realized we didn't have a protection um, in place for those mailboxes for the long term. So to address these challenges, we went through a process of, evalu of evaluating several different vendors. Uh, this process took a couple of months, but we did quickly realize that Rubrik was a clear leader in this space. So with the help of Rubrik, we addressed these challenges by moving to what Matt called a single data fabric. Um, as you can see in this, this diagram, it is much more simple and elegant solution. It really addressed our challenges head on. As you can see here, uh, no longer are we doing site-to-site -site replication. We're basically, uh, we've simplified backups and data management in all three locations with the help of Rubrik CDM appliance as well as virtual appliances with Rubrik Edge, uh, the presence in all three locations. And we're doing all our archival out to AWS uh, S3 for uh, long-term retention. Uh, and then we're also backing up using Polaris. We're, we're accomplishing a few different things. So we're backing up not only Office 365 with Polaris, uh, leveraging uh, Microsoft Azure as the back end to that, but then also too, we're using Polaris more and more to just centrally manage everything. We, we do have a number of appliances deployed um, and Polaris is, is a real great tool to not, not just report on, but also centrally manage those appliances. Uh, particularly from a high level. So as you might imagine, the single data fabric provided significant business value in multiple areas. We're saving time and resources for our administrators so they can focus more on start of semester activities, particularly as it relates to this fall, given the circumstances, and ensuring that students can maintain a positive experience in the new the new normal, basically, the new remote learning environment. We have, we now have full visibility of protected data for operations and security via Polaris, as I mentioned, uh, and that pr is providing more actionable data uh, in making decisions that affect our, the academic environment. A good example of this are the, are the weekly key performance indicators, uh, which are presented every Monday when we meet, but, um, and that helps to keep our overall cloud costs down, uh, particularly as it relates to archival and, and whatnot. Um, and then we've changed the way we've, we archive data and backups for long-term retention. This is really freeing us up to build a better backup retention policy for the university as well. This also helps to address compliance uh, with newer regulations around data, including HIPAA, FERPA, and GDPR. So like most in higher education, we're facing several challenges with recent events. Given the recent circumstances, U University Technology Services or Pacific Technology as we're called, um, we've been primarily focused on uh, for the university facilitating hybrid online uh, learning utilizing the HyFlex model, um, ensuring remote access for students, faculty and staff. We're utilizing services such as AWS Workspaces and RD Gateway for remote access to resources and labs and helping to facilitate direct use of our cloud and SaaS services outside of the VPN. We're addressing and monitoring increased demand of our hosted services, particularly as it relates to Office 365 products. And no longer is there a dependency on our on-premise data centers for email, uh, but also uh, OneDrive, Teams, and SharePoint are dramatically reducing the reliance on in-house services, such as our department shares and home folders. We're also assessing DR readiness and continuity of service, as, as I mentioned, uh, most recently addressing uh, the rolling power outages and wild, wildfires in the Northern California region. Uh, for example, on this point, um, just over a week ago, we actually did experience a power outage on our Stockton campus. However, the data center ser uh, services continued uninterrupted and then with rubric archival to the cloud and cloud on, we had the confidence that we would be prepared for a cutover uh, to AWS should we need to utilize that in the event of a prolonged outage. We do believe that ensuring and, uh, and improving the stability and reliability of our technology services are key to improving our overall student experience and, and success. Rubrik provides the tools necessary to transform uh, data management, as it were, from being an obstacle into being an asset to the university's mission and providing exceptional services for students, faculty, and staff. 
with Polaris and Rubrik CDM really gives us a peace of mind for university operations for our cloud hybrid services, Office 365 and beyond. Um, it's really shaped the way we address, we've addressed these challenges and how we've positioned ourselves with regards to cloud hybrid agility and business continuity as it relates to technology in particular, therefore being an, an integral part of our approach to cloud first. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for attending, and I'll pass this back over for Q&A. Great presentation, really cool stuff. Um, thank you for sharing your real-world you know, story about how, how you're using Rubric, Tony. We really appreciate that. Uh, we got a lot of good questions coming in. Thank you, everyone out there in the audience for the excellent questions. First one, this one is for you, Tony. Uh, how long did it take you to implement Rubric? So when, when we first purchased the product, or the suite of products, I should say. Uh, it did take us a, a little bit of time, probably about a month or two of preparation of our VMware environment and our, our disparate environments. But I, when we did the migration, it took us two weeks. It was very quick. A lot of that entailed, you know, disabling policies previously and then enabling the SLAs, et cetera. Got it, very nice, fast implementation. Uh, next question, they're asking, uh, why did you choose Rubrik over, over other backup solutions out there? What made it really stand out? Uh, there are two primary factors involved in that. Um, so the first is that the, the suite of products that they provided, uh, even at the time, they're continually releasing more and more, um, but um, they really addressed the challenges that we had uh, head on uh, around um, uh, data management, both on-prem and in the cloud. Um, so services, like well just even the cdm itself you know it's highly scalable um it, ha it has a lot of features uh, that really simplify the backup process it's easy to use uh, and then that archival to the cloud was a big one um rubric seemed to do this the most sim in the most simplest and elegant way possible um and then the other side of that too um uh, was the customer relationship i would i would say you know the 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 team presented to us and and everything it's been an excellent relationship and we've been very satisfied very nice yeah that's great to hear um there's a question here about polaris uh and a single pane of glass right are you using polaris there and has it has it provided you what you need I would definitely say yes. Uh, and as time goes on, Polaris is becoming uh, a lot more stronger in that arena. Um, uh, so Polaris uh, can now basically manage pretty much our entire VMware environment as it relates to backups and data protection um, from the central single pane of glass. Um, we were initially, like, like probably many other customers, were using it primarily for reporting, um, but then you know, with the addition of VMware and, and EC2 protection, which we moved from our on-premise appliance into Polaris, now we've really centralized a lot of the data protection um, uh, capabilities. So we and we do use those pretty regularly. So in that respect, nice. it does it does provide a single pane of glass because everything's central from within the portal. Got it. Got it. Okay. Very nice. And then, uh, what about regular disaster recovery exercises? Are are you doing those, and how has Rubrik fit into that? Um, it, it really depends. Um, holistically, we, we we have kind of a loosely based uh, set of policies. Um, you know, obviously, DR involves much more than just technology. It's also related to the business as well. I would say at a more granular level, we do regular um, disaster recovery scenarios. So we, we have utilized, um, uh, you know, live mounting and instant recovery to build out not only just to uh, test uh, recoveries, but then also to to ensure uh, stability um, in said recoveries, as well as build out test dev and stuff like that. Um, and then we've also utilized cloud on to, to uh, ensure that like within a prolonged DR scenario that certain key servers and services would continue to function even in an AWS environment across our VPN hybrid architecture. Very nice. How should people get started with Rubrik? What's the best way? Is this say, and how would they do a POC to, to really prove that this is a great solution for them? I'd say the easiest way to get started, uh, I mean, if you have a contact for a local Rubrik rep in your region, that's the easiest way to get started, obviously. Otherwise, just go to rubrik.com, and there are a multitude of ways to get in contact from there, from, and, a, and a lot of learning resources as well. As well. So you can learn more about our, our platform 
uh, and you can you know, learn all about all the capabilities. Aside from our main website, bluebird.com, uh, one of the things I work on a lot uh, is automation. And so we have an automation repository available at build.rubric.com. And uh, Rubric Build is our program that just highlights all of our open source integrations, automation tooling, and things like that. You know, setting up a POC is something we have uh, prospective customers do all the time, but you know, that would be, you know, reach out to, to us and um, say hello, and we're happy to get that process started. Excellent. That's something that I know that you all at Rubric have always done a great job on is uh, providing training material, educational resources, and, and automation. To me, Rubric is just super strong when it comes to automation. I think that's all the time we have, but it's been really great having you on. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Tony, and thank you for being here, Matt. Absolutely. Great. Thank you very much. All right. I've just brought up a poll for everyone out there in the audience. It says, what additional information would you like about the rubric solution? And I'll leave that up. We do have a few questions here we didn't have time for. I know I apologize for that, uh, but we will route those to Matt over at rubric. Uh, so um, thank you for those questions. Keep them coming. Great questions. Uh, if you would like more info there of any shape or form, uh, just go ahead and select that in the poll question. And I'll leave that up while we announce our first Amazon $500 gift card winner. Um, this gift card is going to Joe Ray Faithry from Texas. Congratulations, Joe Ray Faithry from Texas. Still two more gift cards to give out after our next presentation, so make sure you stay tuned for that. And uh, let me give everyone a few more minutes, or not minutes, seconds, to uh, answer the poll question there, that's there on the screen before I introduce you to our next presenter. Uh, I know Jonathan out there mentioned he had trouble with the poll. Uh, just push refresh on your web browser, 99% uh, of the time that will resolve it. If you don't see the poll, uh, also for all these events, uh, Chrome or Firefox are the recommended web browsers. Hopefully that helps to resolve that question. All right. Thank you, everyone out there who responded to the poll question. We do appreciate that. I know Rubric appreciates it as well. And with that, it's time. Keep our Ecocast moving here. I'm excited to introduce our next presenter on this Ecocast, welcoming Mr. Matt Wallace. Chief Technology Officer at Faction. Matt, are you there? I am. Hey, good morning. Good morning, Matt. Thanks for being on. Take it away. Yeah, happy to be here. I guess good afternoon, depending on where you're at. So thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm excited uh, to kind of talk about you know, our thoughts about uh, next-gen IT environments. And I have you know, some really interesting stuff to share. It's really oriented around some projects we've been doing lately in life sciences and some lessons learned. Um, just, you know, I guess, the two cents about me, I've been doing this for way too long. Um, I've been involved in cloud uh, back when it was ex excruciatingly painful. And I've kind of been all over the board uh, from software development to infrastructure and managed services um, at places both very large and very small. Uh, it gives you some interesting perspective, and I, I'll say I, I tend to look at this stuff very much from a developer perspective on a lot of things, maybe more so than a lot of folks who are infrastructure-focused. You know, Faction's been around a long time, um, but in the past you know, three years or so, we've been uh, focused a lot on uh, fleshing out our multi-cloud platform uh, offerings. And I'm going to talk about a lot this today because it ties a lot into, I think, the challenges that folks have around digital transformation um, and modernizing their application stacks and so on. Um, you know, since Dell Tech World has just wrapped up, I think you know, one of the ways that people may know us, although they don't know us maybe by that name, is Dell Technologies um, operates a, a series of services called Dell Technologies Cloud Storage for Multi-Cloud, and that's powered by Faction's multi-cloud services platform. So um, we've been partnering up with Dell to deploy those, and a lot of the lessons learned really come from um, interacting with the large customers that uh, we've been helping with some of these things. So to start off with, and I think it's maybe interesting to say, you know, there's this whole distribution of data and distribution of computing that's going on right now. Um, I think we're on the more academic side of these things, but you know, the traditional data center that kind of held your virtual machines, your applications, and your data, and it was pretty self-contained. Um, you know, enterprises large and small, whether it was you know two racks in a little closet, 
um, in the headquarters of the baby generator out back, or whether it was you know 27 data strainers strewn across the globe, you know dealing with you know 100 billion dollars worth of financial transactions. A lot of them were very centralized. Um, what we're seeing now, obviously, is this evolution and this continuum everywhere from people who are very cloud focused, the cloud native companies that start there, go up there, and stay there, um, you know, to, to folks who are still largely in the data center, but they're kind of teasing out how they use cloud for scale, for geography, uh, for innovative services, um, and of course, edge. And edge is like everybody's favorite you know, um, word to kind of throw around as a buzzword. But it's very interesting, and of course, I'm you know, gearing up here to pre order my. Uh, iPhone 12, and I'm pretty excited about 5G finally being attached to the iPhone, and just pretty excited about 5G in general. And as somebody who once owned, and I guess I'm dating myself, a 100-300 baud modem, the idea that I can get you know hundreds of megabits to my phone just blows my mind away. Um, so I'm really excited about this. But when you think about these use cases that we're seeing, you know, where people could potentially do things like play a game on an Xbox that doesn't actually have the game that's being played effectively over a network with the actual running and the GPU hosted elsewhere and transmitted data fast enough that it's a decent playing experience, that's mind-blowing. Think about that happening over wireless networks. And that's just the tiniest and maybe least important slice of this when you think about the applications across healthcare and so on and so forth. But all of these um, evolutions with cloud, with edge, they're definitely creating data management challenges. And you know, for people who have been kind of dealing with um, some of the challenges um, with sort of digital transformation, you're probably familiar with this diagram. This is the classic, they call it the six R's diagram. Um, and I think possibly Amazon um, may have done it first. I think I, I borrowed this version from um, some folks at Lucidchart who included it in a um, blog entry. And actually Lucidchart has a template for this. Um, but it has these, these paths basically for um, how you move data across, right? And you have this ability to, you know, uh, retain, retire, redesign, repurchase, replatform, rehost, right? And that was kind of Amazon's view at the time, I think, of the, the ways to do a thing. And of course, they can see, you know, retain and retire are these sort of like dead ends, right? The workload doesn't really go anywhere. And then if you want to do some digital transformation for a particular uh, application, it's anywhere from, you know, I'm going to just move it to instance types that match what I kind of do on-prem to I'm going to just get rid of the application completely and just rent a SaaS service, right? Why are we doing this, uh, for example, this internal content management system? Let's just move to Confluence, for example, um, or things of that nature. Um, but then, you know, rewriting applications is obviously where uh, you get really the most bang for your buck, but it's the most effort. The funny thing is, I've been on a lot of panels and done a lot of talks where people talk about um, the sort of nitty-gritty details of moving an application, transforming an application. And there's something that gets left out almost every time, and it's really the data. And we are increasingly living in a data-driven era. And I have to say, it almost surprises me because in many ways, especially with the you know, VMware Cloud on AWS and the VMware environments going to Azure and Google, it's never been easier, really, to kind of move applications to the cloud. Right? You have this ability to take whole, like, suites of applications, move them into the public cloud, leverage some of the VMware services if you need to, because you can't transform it. It doesn't replatform very well or easily, but that doesn't move your data for you. And it's challenging because, of course, if you move an application and it has data and you can't move the data at the same time and vice versa, they're really useless without one another. And data gravity makes it a little difficult to separate applications. So of course, inside the enterprise, you'll have 10 applications or 20 or 50 or 100 that all use the same data set. And you can't move one without moving the other 99, or you cause a big problem. And so we've been helping with this. And part of that, of course, is because you know, the services that we offer with Dell um, are compatible, generally speaking, with replication from on-prem platforms. So folks that are using things like PowerStore, PowerScale, Unity, PowerMax, et cetera, can actually replicate into these cloud and multi-cloud volumes. And that gives them a sort of easy button to get data moved over and then kind of cut across. But you know, there's still ways you've got to think about this, right? Are you going to replicate the data? And of course, this is where you know we do really well in helping out. If you're going to reformat and rehost, you know, what's the new data format? You know, if we come across people who have, say, file systems, um, and they're interested in you know doing it inexpensively in cloud, and so they're thinking about migrating some other data into object storage. Okay, but then what's your topology for you know what? Where does a what's the mapping of a folder into a bucket, and where do the objects go, and who owns those, and what's the account structure? 
it can kind of turn into a problem that's much larger than people um, really believe. So you know, we can't go into too much depth on this, but I'm running through some of these just to kind of talk about some of those challenges and kind of how we deal with some of these. I mean, a great example here is with our scale-out file service, because we are supporting simultaneously on the same footprint, simultaneously access uh, for NFS, for SIFS, um, aka Windows file sharing, for object storage, S3 compatible, um, and for HDFS, right, the same thing with Hadoop and big data workloads, that you can use those on the same data. It basically gives you this ability to construct a multi-protocol data lake that can truly be kind of all things to all people. And I don't even think I mentioned this on the slide where, but because it can scale up to 50 petabytes and we can deliver literally two terabits per second of cloud connectivity across multiple clouds, makes it actually really powerful and easy for people to kind of transform, right? If you have dozens or more of accounts, if you've got this gigantic sort of estate of data and you're trying to figure out how do I manage this, well, it's actually probably the easiest way in one sense is have one unified environment because it simplifies the challenges of governance and so on associated with that. And of course, then we have this replication tools to, to help it happen. So perfect example here. So for folks who have a lot of these Dell platforms on-prem, make it super easy to do this transition because we can actually tie the relationship directly from the on-prem hardware into our service and then actually it's being handled at that layer and so it kind of becomes transparent to the end user, right? We can facilitate a cut over in almost the same way you'd cut over a virtual machine or things of that nature. So a really powerful kind of set of tools here for simplifying that. Um, you know, what's interesting is, um, you know, the classic 6R, and I, I really just highlighted this here, right, which is the, the sort of AWS version of this, they really did make the reuse version or the, um, or retain was their version of this particular bullet, basically, was they, they consider that to be a dead end. Now, the truth is, what we recognize, what we see with our customers is sometimes people do need to retain data on-prem, but it doesn't mean they don't want to move to the cloud. This is where things begin to get challenging, because they now have this data estate that needs to be split up and replicated between multiple locations. And what we've been able to do is kind of kill multiple birds with one stone in many cases for our customers where they can take this data footprint, replicate it into our multi-cloud services, have it available to multiple clouds, actually take copies of the data and snapshot read-only replicas that are flowing from on-prem and then present that point-in-time data into the clouds. Fantastic because now they can test the viability of an application they can actually convert those read-only copies to sort of read-write clones even. So they've got a sort of fork of the data that they can then use to say, like, okay, does my application work normally if I refactor it this way or if I move it into this new platform? Um, it also lets them do things like analytics. So for example, we have a customer in the oil and gas space that has four and a half petabytes of sonar scans on-prem, and they need to replicate that data to a second location because it's you know business critical. Their um, discovery practice you know, out there hunting for I guess you'd call it almost virtual wildcatting, basically, but hunting for where oil might exist in an undersea floor. Um, they have to have that data for their application to run, so they've got to protect it. They replicate it. We can help them do a disaster recovery using VMware Cloud and AWS, but although we can recover their VMware workloads, we also have this like multiple petabytes of in their data lake of these sonar scans. We can take that data even when they're still running before they've failed over because that second copy exists. We can present it to multiple public clouds where they can then use their data science team to leverage public cloud services to see what sort of additional insights they can glean from that information. So that's pretty powerful capability and kind of one of those ways we start actually helping people in um, multiple aspects even with the same data. And of course it, it helps because we're actually you know, competitive and, and less expensive than the comparable file services in the native clouds, even just one, let alone multiple at the same time. But really, it really amplifies the value when you're getting multiple things out of it, like resiliency plus access to cloud services and that synchronization to kind of remove the challenges of migrating data. So that's pretty powerful. So with that having been said, and I'm kind of talking about the platform and what we do to kind of stitch on-prem to cloud to edge a little bit. But what does that mean, and why do you care about multi-cloud, and what is multi-cloud in the next-gen IT environment, right? Very important question, and I think it's very strange for us because I've been talking about multi-cloud for, for three years, and I've had a pretty, I think, consistent message about it, and I'm just now watching the world kind of wake up and turn it into the biggest buzzword on Earth. 
But there's one particular thing that I've always felt was going to drive people to multi-cloud, and it really, had, it really looks like this. So across all of the major CSPs, you know, you could keep in mind that the, the large service providers are now pulling in tens of billions of dollars a year, right? It's close to a hundred billion dollar a year market for these, and it's growing still at an incredible clip, right? So that probably 200 billion is, is uh, almost in the bag, as they say. So if you have fierce competitors with incredibly talented staffs competing for $200 billion a year worth of revenue um, with actually reasonable margins, this is not like a Walmart, you know, where they're making pennies on the purchase, um, what does that mean? It means innovation because these guys are going to fight tooth and nail to deliver developers um, and teams the best possible experience. But experience isn't just a good portal and good performance and scale anymore. Right? Everybody's got the same instances. Everybody has private networking. Everybody has object storage and file storage and block storage. It's all passe in a way. You know, there's an equivalent, and you can almost Google for what's the Azure equivalent of X or what's the AWS equivalent of Y and literally find these you know, comparisons for almost all of these services. Um, but these things are still pouring millions of dollars in innovation. And where is that going? And the reality is it's services that are further up the stack, right? It's things that help you with anything from you know, deep learning to collaborative development to code deployment um, to interacting with edge services, right? Something like AWS Wavelength, making it easier basically to connect your application to a 5G network. So with things like that, you know, what happens when these services are more differentiated? Because the truth is if I want eight cores and 32 gigs of RAM in a cloud, it doesn't really matter where that is if that's my only requirement. They all have the same, you know, Linux and Windows instances available, and you could quibble here and there about you know, cost of this and network that and so on. But it's really about the ecosystem of services that surround it. What we realize is that people who can pick and choose data, um, take their data and pick and choose services across clouds, actually unlock this sort of universe of innovation. One thing we hear consistently is that people go to public cloud, not really for cost savings or scale, but innovation is like the number one driver. It's agility, right? The ability to make their business move faster, develop things easier, and the further they get up the stack of these services, um, you know, the, the faster it goes. I had my own team recently needed to kind of deploy a little bit of a microservice, and they were kind of thinking about how they wanted to deploy it. I said, well, why don't you guys use um, API Gateway and Lambda on Amazon? Because it'd be a fun project, it'd be fun to do it that way. But also I knew that because it was, you know, required this external facing API, that the functionality was relatively simple. It was very event driven. It would be a great fit for that, right? And the team got, of course, really excited about doing that because it's a pretty fun, actually, project to dig into. But that sort of thing is the kind of innovation, I think, that drives people to go, like, how can I get stuff done faster, right? And I'll tell you, there is this whole universe of challenge that ties into these data transformation things, right? So as you start to move towards these cloud services, you have to constantly be asking, you know, what am I doing with my data? And what's interesting, of course, is tons of that innovation is oriented around data. And you're hearing all these phrases like, oh, data's the new oil and things of that nature, right? It's not wrong. Um, I heard the story at a conference maybe three or four years ago that just blew my mind, but there was a, a project basically that had looked at people's um, retail shopping habits, right? Like think loyalty cards in the supermarket. And while doctors with professional equipment were unable to detect um, Alzheimer's, they could actually detect early onset Alzheimer's from people's shopping habits because people who were beginning to develop Alzheimer's started to change their buying habits to become more narrow. They would try less new things. And as they fed this through um, a machine learning algorithm, they were able to tune it to the point where it could actually find this pattern, this shifting of buying habits on people. That's the kind of incredible thing that these large data sets are enabling. But in order to deal with that, you have to be able to get data from the edge, store it centrally, also attach it to the cloud. You want to attach it to multiple clouds, right? And of course, data generates data. You're storing raw data in a data lake, but you're also running ETL processes on it to generate derivative data, et cetera, et cetera. But you also have many teams that want to deal with it. They're attached to multiple cloud environments. And this can be a real governance and connectivity and operational challenge. We make this dead simple by having these large scale-out file systems we can attach to multiple clouds, multiple accounts across clouds, and actually put you in charge of being able to do that. We recently demonstrated this in what we called Project Triumph, and I did a full presentation about this about a couple of weeks ago at BioIT World, but we actually were able to show this incredible architecture where we actually had um, thousands of human genomes, and we were able to accelerate the processing leveraging GPUs across multiple clouds. 
where we've delivered hundreds of gigabits of connectivity, and this is basically our lab environment, hundreds of gigabits of connectivity across multiple clouds over a million CUDA cores on NVIDIA hardware to do hardware accelerated genomic analysis. Perfect example of the way that you can kind of deal with this and the way that we enable this. And a shocking thing is that if you were able to use three clouds, the spot instance cost across those three clouds actually was cheaper than, than buying on-prem hardware, even if you could run that hardware five years on-prem 24 by 7, and that blew my mind. Uh, it's actually really interesting how cheap the Azure and GCP spot or preemptible instances are. I'll highlight this because some of this might have you thinking like, well, how performant is this if you have a storage platform that sits between the clouds? The answer is super performant. So this is like kind of our smaller environment here, right? This is effectively running out of my, my demo lab. You can see 140 gigabits of throughput flowing into Azure in this part of the test and the graph on the bottom right, which is from our uh, Grafana instance. And you can see we've got millisecond or less latency basically here across all three clouds simultaneously. And you can see the mount point directly. We've got 328 out of 442 terabytes free. Again, pretty minimal size footprint here. We can scale that up to 50 petabytes of data, and we can access it, like I said earlier, across multiple protocols, NFS, SIFS, Object, and HDFS. Really mind-boggling. The cool thing about this, though, is it's not static. So you can go into our portal, and you can actually modify um, where your connectivity sits. So one day you might have 10 or 20 or 40 gigabits going to Amazon. Your team goes, hey, we need to actually turn this application up in, in um, AWS. We can add a leg to that connectivity dynamically into Amazon. The data never has to move, and you actually can control that. So your bandwidth from this cloud attached storage product actually flows into Faction's Internet Work Exchange, our data fabric that touches all the clouds. You get to dynamically provision it between Amazon, Azure, Google, Oracle Cloud, Internet connectivity. And of course, we can actually take cross-connects as well for people who want to buy private lines directly in to connect it to on-prem, we can tie directly into the carrier. So that really is that powerful network flexibility. Um, speaking of which, I mean, that really is what it's all about, right? Looking at your clouds, being able to kind of decide where you want that footprint to go. So in brief, data is exploding, critical to digital transformation. You absolutely need to have to worry about this state from edge to data center to cloud, and we help enable those transitions of data, but also, the innovation across multiple clouds at the same time. Um, and we do it with this amazing architecture that's incredibly scalable, very flexible, um, and sort of end user driven. And with that, happy to take questions. I'm really excited about it. Absolutely, yeah. Great presentation, Matt. Uh, we do have some questions for you. While we take some questions, I'm just going to bring up this poll for the audience. Uh, I want to call everyone's attention to, and that is what in additional information would you like about Faction? So we'll just leave that up. Um, Matt, let's see, first question I see that came in here, they're asking about uh, in the portal, when you add a cloud connection, how does it have access to, the, uh, to configure the customer side? Okay, yeah, good question. Um, this may not have been completely obvious from the diagram that we showed around Project Triumph. Um, Faction does completely manage the networking here, right? So you're not, we're not giving you a storage platform, you stitch the clouds, right, 100%. Um, configured and managed by us right up into the part that's in your cloud environment. So each of the clouds has a component that basically stitches to outside resources. In Amazon, it's Direct Connect uh, as a virtual private gateway, Direct Connect gateway, Transit gateway can all do it. Um, in Azure, it's the Express Route gateway. In Google, it's the Cloud Router, right? All these kind of virtual constructs for tying in. We effectively extend the leg of our network that reaches into your environment. It's sort of an offer, basically. Um, in Amazon, it manifests as a pair of this that we offer you that you can see in the console. You accept them, you attach them to your gateway. Um, on the Azure side, um, likely we give you an authorization key in a URI, and you can redeem that to basically kind of attach the Express Route circuit to your account and then tie it into your gateway. Um, so there's some minor configuration due to plummet into your network, but pretty much everything that sits outside of a CSP, including all the BGP, the routing, the layer three, is all stuff that we handle, which is actually very different too from most connectivity providers. You know, most people are actually giving you layer two cloud connectivity where you have to manage all the routing and the connectivity and so on kind of on that layer. And we're doing it at layer three and managing all the BGP and the routing and even um, your ability to choose like, do I want cloud environment A to C cloud environment B or both of them just to see the storage platform is something kind of we let you decide, um, but then we manage on our end. Got it. Okay, interesting. And so when you talk about this kind of networking, cloud networking solution, uh, there's a question here, is this SD-WAN or is this different from that? 
Uh, it's definitely very different from SD-WAN, although we do have uh, eight patents now in multi-cloud uh, network IP. It's very kind of our secret sauce. Super optimized around very low latency, everything from uh, the network equipment to the configuration to the data center proximity to the fiber layout, um, you know, the way everything is configured is really oriented around just you know, a few things, right? It's uh, low latency, high throughput, total isolation and security. That's like really all we think about um, as far as that goes. And we've been literally doing that. If you go back all the way to 2006, Action's earliest origins was actually as a sort of multi-network um, provider in a sense. We actually worked to provide telcos a platform to connect their networks. And so, you know, we've been reapplying technology that for us in many ways is like over a decade old to this multi-cloud problem. Um, it's different than SD-WAN because we kind of control all the networking. And we can actually terminate an SD-WAN connection in order to tie into these multi-cloud environments. Um, and in a sense, it's very similar because we do a lot of software-defined things so that we don't, um, we help customers avoid, for example, overlapping IP spaces, overlapping VLANs, things like that with our sort of software-defined network fabric, but difference in the sense that we have a lot of control and visibility in the paths. And so, um, you know, we're kind of not dealing with multiple WAN links. Also very different from SD-WAN in the sense that although SD-WAN optimizes WAN connections, um, you know, we're dealing with like millisecond or less latencies, generally speaking, in our platform because we want basically our platform to look like it's uh, if you think of the cloud as your data center, we want our platform to feel like it's in the data center with you, which it does, as you can see from the kind of latency screenshots. Yeah, that's amazing, millisecond or less latencies. Um, I know you talked about the genomics uh, use case, but what are some of the other, you know, most common use, ha use cases that people are coming to you uh, to, for your help with? Yeah, well, okay, so I, I ad hoc mentioned, uh, by the way, that sort of uh, petrotechnical use case, right? Good example, we actually have several customers in the oil and gas space. They just all deal with large data sets. Media and entertainment's another, and it's a weird thing because, you know, Netflix and Apple TV and Disney streaming and HBO and, like, this bevy of all these streaming companies are now dominating, dominating content creation. But it's not like one studio does anything anymore, right? You see the credits for like a movie, if you could ever go see a movie because of COVID, and it's like pages and pages and pages of all these different independent companies because one company is color correcting pixels and six of them are doing different types of special effects and so on, but they're all using the same raw footage. And so a great example in media entertainment is we're giving people access to literally tens of thousands of spot cores. In fact, as part of our project, we're releasing a white paper where we show a rendering farm that immediately scales up to tens of thousands of cores uh, to do some rendering from a scene from Moana that Disney open sourced um, as an example. But the neat thing about the multi-cloud aspect, since you can control the connectivity, you can also provide you know, partners and so on with access to the same data footprints. You could have one studio working on one thing, another studio working on another on two different clouds without having to move or copy the data. So huge cost savings and convenience there and access um, ability. So that's a, a really good example. Tons of uh, healthcare. In fact, um, in the day, day two uh, keynote at Dell Technologies World, um, we saw Centara Healthcare talking about you know, modernizing their patient records, right? Perfect example. So you can see them actually talking about their use of faction solution in webinars that are out there, right? So tons of interest and effort around healthcare and healthcare modernization as well. And I, I'd say wherever you find a big data footprint, which I'd say anything larger than maybe 100, 200 terabytes, you're almost certain to find us kind of there with a pretty good solution. And for certain use cases like DR for VMware environments in a public cloud, we get into this with much smaller footprints as well. Um, but I think anytime you're kind of getting those hundreds of terabytes, the faction's kind of offering here becomes almost a de facto best way to do things in a multi-cloud world. Very cool, very cool. And so I get the idea that you all at Faction take a very consultative approach. If someone comes to you with an application or a data set that they're interested in moving to the cloud, um, you all really sit down and, and do that sort of analysis with them to help them make the right decision because there's so many different options today, different clouds, different technologies. Is Am I understanding correctly? You know, we do actually have a pretty robust professional services team. I mean, you noticed in our maybe interest side, or maybe didn't, but you know, we're an Amazon advanced consulting partner, and we're not the traditional, you know, Amazon MSP. 
you know, I don't want to monitor your Amazon workloads, and I don't really want to design your elastic load balancer architecture, although my team has done that and done landing zone implementations. Like the oil and gas customer I mentioned, they were moving into Amazon for the first time. So we actually did Amazon's, you know, well-architected framework kind of implementation with the landing zone implementation and so on. Um, and so we do some of that consulting. However, you know, what we're pushing very hard for, and I think you can kind of garner this from the, the portal, and we're aiming to have our public API release at the end of this year too that the portal sits on top of, is just allowing people um, to consume this stuff completely programmatically. You know, the ability to attach to multiple clouds is a great feature. But when you realize that you can push a button or call an API and move that in minutes, you know, the possibilities become a, a lot more robust, right? And so we're actually moving much more towards a world where we want to make this easier, make it more building blocks, and actually kind of do more reference architectures for folks so they can actually understand, oh, I can build this myself. I've got all the tools. Um, but yeah, we do actually have a pretty robust practice for people who kind of need help figuring out, or if they're just doing something that's never been done. I mean, we've been involved with some self-driving car project, for example, that the scale and throughput and you know technical constraints and the speed at which we had to go to kind of have timely retraining on a model with that much data really required us to dig in. And so for things like that, we do get very consultative. Very nice. It's good to know that you all offer both of those options for you know no matter what a company needs. If they need some handhelding and and uh, veteran you know expert advice, then you guys can can help with that. Or if they just need to consume things on an ABI basis, then then that's there as well. So. Uh, very cool, really cool yeah. stuff that you guys are doing there at Faction. Uh, Matt, it's been great having you on. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. For more information on Faction, check out the handout that's available there for download in your audience console. That's uh, Matt's entire slide deck. Uh, and then, of course, you can also go to factioninc.com. I'm going there right now in my web browser, uh, factioninc.com, and that will take you to uh, Faction's uh, landing page there. You can request a quote. You can get a video overview, learn about their fully managed multi-cloud, uh, the multi-cloud advantage, uh, and the many different use cases that uh, they you know, specialize in. Um, also see their, their data center locations around the world. So uh, really cool stuff. Uh, thank you to Faction for supporting today's Ecocast, and thank you to Rubrik as well. It's now time for our final gift card announcement. We have an Amazon $500 gift card going to Bob Leach from Ohio, and Dave Schul from Virginia. Congratulations, Dave Shu from Virginia and Bob Leach from Ohio, and our previous prize winner, Joe Ray Faithry from Texas. Before you go, I want to remind you to subscribe to the 10 on Tech podcast in the iTunes store. If you are a potential sponsor of an upcoming Megacast or Ecocast, reach out to us at connect at actualtechmedia.com. And of course, I hope to see you next week on our Enabling Edge Environments Ecocast with Hewlett Packard Enterprise and Flexential. After today's event, your web browser will be automatically redirected to our events homepage where you can uh, register for this event and numerous other upcoming events. We, of course, we thank you for your support. Uh, thanks for being on. Hope you enjoyed that interview with Mr. Bill Clayman at the start of the event. And um, we'll see you next time. Have a great day. Bye-bye.